Eu acho que o mais importante de tudo é a sua fé. O quanto que você acredita, não no que os outros falam, mas sim naquilo que você acredita de você. Mas o quanto você acredita. The Ultimate Fighting Championship is going all out on October 22nd. And Abu Dhabi gets the honor of playing host to one of the most stacked fight cards in recent memory, UFC 280. This is the card of the year. Volkan Ozdemir, Bilal Mohamed, and Benil Dariush on the undercard and three massive fights at the end to send the crowd home happy. The dominant uncrowned champion defending his throne against the unstoppable contender from Dagestan. This will hands down be the toughest fight Islam's ever faced. Two of the most polarizing personalities in the bantamweight division colliding for UFC gold. TJ versus Sterling, what do you guys think? TJ did an interview on this and he said, Sterling's an easy fight for me. He's not championship caliber. And to get us ready, the star prospect at 135 is also facing the most dangerous contender in the world. We got UFC 280. Those dudes are savages, man. Welcome to the fighting business. Deeper dive of the year for the fight card of the year. Come along as we dive deep into three of the most anticipated matchups of the year. There is a lot to unpack here, so grab your popcorn, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Peter Yon versus Sean O'Malley. My question is for Sean O'Malley. How do you see yourself getting it done against Peter Yon? I'd love to put him face first into the canvas. Um, you know, he's a pretty slow starter. Sean O'Malley's last fight was eagerly aiming those who were clearly less skilled than him. O'Malley took a step up in competition when he signed up to face Pedro Munoz at UFC 276. Finally, fans and company executives alike would see just how good O'Malley really was. Unfortunately, the fight bombed and was stopped early due to an accidental eye poke. Aside from the lackluster action, what really sucked was that we didn't get anything more out of O'Malley. Nobody really gained in that. We saw that Pedro can compete, obviously. He has been competing for a long time. We also saw that Sean O'Malley is as viable as many people think he is. That all changes now at UFC 280. We won't just know his ceiling in the division. We will know his personality as a fighter, as everything from his art to his will will be tested by one of the baddest bantamweights around. This insane dude went from Rolian Paeva to Pedro Munoz to Peter Yan. I mean, Peter was the only one that didn't have a fight book, uh, and I was ready to, you know, book a fight. Peter said, "If I win, call him out." I didn't get the mic after the fight, but you know, I think this fight makes sense. It's you know been a couple years coming. Peter is no longer the champion. But make no mistake, the guy is still a force of nature at 135 and arguably the best bantamweight in the world. I know, he lost to Sterling, but he lost by the skin of his teeth. And if you score the fight for Jan, welcome to the club. We are many. The former champion is as fast, powerful, and skilled as ever. And unlike Pedro Munoz, Jan will not hang back and kick from a distance. After a couple minutes of gathering intel, Jan will go right after Sugar and put on him the kind of pressure O'Malley has never experienced before. And I highly doubt we will see the usual shtick from O'Malley. We know him as the flashy and slick counter striker who styles on his opponents. But against a guy like No Mercy, it's hard to look cool. But Peter Young, the former world champion? Just a, an, ass a, 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 an assassin, a murderer. Jan has some of the best boxing fundamentals in the division. And to get his respect in the striking department, Sugar will have to keep it simple, effective, and most importantly, consistent. You know, I, I believe I'm better than Peter Jan, and I believe I'm going to go out there and, and beat his ass, so... Jan is perfectly capable of fighting five rounds at the same pace, and once he sees a drop in output, he does... Boldly put together fighter, well-rounded, and the way he mixes it up is just next level as well. He knows, he's got great fight IQ, he knows how to create advantages during the fight. On the other hand, the first round will be crucial for O'Malley, as Jan usually starts slow to get the distance and timing down. Sean needs to put up one hell of a showing in the first round if he is to win this fight. I was like, that's a fight I've wanted for a couple of years. I'm getting paid. Um, so I, right when they called me, he's like, hey, you don't have to like, what, what, what do you think of this? And I was like, yes, 100%, let's get this done. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't think Peter was gonna take the fight, to be honest. So I was messaging him personally on Instagram, being like, just trying to you know, get under skin to where he's like, what motherfucker? O'Malley took this fight for a reason. And you can tell by looking at him, the guy believes in himself to be the best in the division. And to prove this, he had no problem taking on the boogeyman of the 135 pound division. 
if he pulls off the upset and say hello to the biggest star in the bantamweight division, bar none. But with the win over Pewter, is the expectation and the plan to fight for that title next? Pretty much. I mean, I don't see any see it going any other way. I just... But if Jan wins, he gets back on the winning column, adds a popular name to his resume, and goes straight to the title picture where he belongs. And speaking of the title picture, Aljamain Sterling versus TJ Dillashaw. This is probably where I'll do my training camp at. I mean, I'm not, not too worried about Sterling. Pretty easy fight for me, to be honest. And uh, maybe I'll just do my training camp here on the beach with drink in hand and get the job done, you know? <laughs> The co-main event is a bantamweight title clash between Aljamain Sterling and TJ Dillashaw. Sterling is one of the more disliked champion in the UFC, and this will be Dillashaw's second fight back after his PD suspension. The guy's a cheating little weasel that's been doing this for years, you know, so you've done it the dirty way, you didn't really do it on your own merit and just your own blood, sweat and tears kind of thing, so. Polarizing personalities, interesting styles, and a whole lot of heat. Sterling loves playing heel persona, and Dillashaw is a natural himself. The heelist MF belt, anyone? Kidding aside, this is the last chance for TJ Dillashaw to get the belt back. He is 36 years of age, and the guy is likely not in his physical prime anymore. He came back from two-year suspension and won a fight against Corey Sanhagen, a top contender in the division. But a lot of people thought Corey did enough to win. Dillashaw is definitely slower than in his prime years, but he is somewhat able to compensate for his declining attributes with better skills and technique. His boxing is getting better but his durability is starting to slip. He was hurt in the San Hagen fight and blew his knee out in the first round. The two-time champion was able to soldier through the pain and see the end of the fight, but the injury and the subsequent knee surgery definitely added more wear and tear. I think just off the top right now thinking, I think TJ can get the job done. That's what I was thinking. The Funk Master definitely has an edge in jujitsu, but Dillashaw is a vastly underrated wrestler. He was last taken down by John Lineker in 2010, and the guy who was able to consistently score takedowns on Dillashaw was Dominic Cruz. Sterling does not move like the Dominator, and his wrestling is not on that level either. To be honest, five years ago, people would scoff at this matchup as TJ was at a much higher level, but Father Time is undefeated, and at this age, you can decline overnight. He might be improving in skill, but skill doesn't matter when your opponent is operating at twice the speed that you are. Furthermore, Sterling is younger, bigger, and has fought more often in the past couple of years. If he gets the back of TJ, whether through a takedown or a scramble, he ain't letting TJ up until the end of the round. A submission victory is unlikely, but constantly defending submissions attempts from the back is exhausting as all hell. Fuck, Al's just a stud too. Dude. Yes, yeah. dude, that's a tough fight to predict. It's gonna Super be a good getting that back on TJ. You think he can take his back? I think he's getting the back. If TJ wins, he becomes the second fighter after Randy Couture to win the title three times. That's a feat in itself. The division has a lot of exciting fights for Dillashaw, but retirement, even with a victory, might not be too far off. Sterling wins and he runs it back with Peter Yan a third time. There is a mini tournament going on, and the victory of the Yan and O'Malley fight will definitely be watching. We got 30 days, baby, to UFC 280, Aljamain Sterling. And still, we're gonna skin the snake, baby! Skin the snake! Let's go! Charles Oliveira versus Islam Makhachev. Islam Makhachev, Charles Oliveira, UFC 280, going down from Abu Dhabi, Fight Island. At last, we arrive at the main event of the biggest card of the year, the spiritual successor to the match that was too good for this world. Or so they say. It's a good fight. It's a good fight. Needs to worry about. Not worrying about. Um, needs to worry about um, Charles. You know, Charles is a, is a, is a dangerous, dangerous opponent, and right. I think he's taking seriously. You know, he's a got great jiu-jitsu, great striking, and great grappling. So Charles Oliveira, an upgraded Tony Ferguson versus Islam Mahachev, the second coming of Habib Nurmagomedov. Or so they say. Oh yeah, he's a good champ. Yeah, that's who I think is. Do a you champ. think he beats Charles? Oliver? Oh yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, I think. There, I don't think anybody's gonna beat him. There's not many people that I watch of that like I'll watch their grappling and be like, this is exactly what I would do. Vacant title will be on the line, and both of these lightweights are hungry for gold. Charles was the champion. Hell, he still is the uncrowned champion in the eyes of the majority, but he needs his belt back so he can continue his championship legacy in the record books. On the other hand, this will be Islam's first shot at the title. Habib won the title in this first try in emphatic fashion. Will Islam be able to accomplish the same feat against a guy like Oliveira? People, a lot of people think you're the greatest ever. Can Islam actually be better than you, Habib? Is, is that possible? 
definitely it's possible, you know. Right now it's like this is legacy fight for Islam. Why I really want he fight versus Charles Oliveira because he had 11 win streak, Islam 10 win streak. Yeah. And UFC never make like this fight. To answer that question, let's go through the tale of the tape. Charles Oliveira is a complete fighter, proven beyond a shadow of doubt now. They said his striking was mediocre, and he went to war with the best strikers in the division. They said he didn't have the heart to become the champion, and the man started going super saying whenever he was hurt. Point proven. Ain't saying anything now. Charles Oliveira has been tremendous up at lightweight. I think he's on a 10 or an 11 fight win streak. Offensively, the guy might be peerless in the division. He's just as dangerous on his feet as he is on the ground. And that is saying something. There is no safe spot when you're in there with Du Bronx. Stand with him and he'll rock you. My last fight, you know, Charles was uh, brilliant, you know, and he hurt me often. He hurt me early. 10 seconds in, I was... Uh, you know, really take him down and he'll snatch your neck or whichever lamp he wants to take home. Despite all of that, despite the fact that he has beaten the likes of Poirier, Gaethje and Chandler, Oliveira is still the underdog. The former champion who has basically cleared out most of the top five is the underdog to Islam Mahachev. Islam has two rank wins, but let's say it like it is. The guy is not good. He's phenomenal. He has finished his last four fights and has absorbed a grand total of 35 strikes during all of that. He is 20 and 1. For years, we were told that Mahachev would rule the roost at 155 once Habib stepped away. Islam have to be. Islam have to come. Like you finish and Islam come, it have to be like on the same time. You guys three years different, like between you guys, and I really believe like like your prime time is gonna be very soon. After that, like when you finish, you're gonna go. But he have to come. But I told Islam, you're a little bit late, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Easier said than done, but take a look at the guy. He is something special. His opponents know what he is going to go for, and yet nobody is able to stop him. He gets to you, he stays on you, and then he drowns you. The guy is no slouch at submission himself, and once he sees a limb or an exposed neck, it is all over. I believe that uh, Charles is a very nice kid and uh, come from a humble beginning. But when you got inside the cage, uh, Islam gonna show it's a level to this. It's a level to this. You know, everybody said Charles was the champion. I, I, I think he was just Habib let him borrow the belt for Islam to have it. Stylistically, this is the fight you just don't know what is going to happen. At least when it comes to the grappling exchanges. Oliveira has a vicious ground game, but if anyone can control him on the ground, it's Islam. Chandler was able to stay in his guard without getting submitted, and Islam works a much more brutal ground game than Chandler. His pressure from top position breaks people, but at the same time, if anyone can submit Islam Mahachev, it is Charles Oliveira, the guy with the most submission victories in the UFC, and one sloppy entry, it might be over. He's gonna have to be careful. If he wants to be the champ, if he wants to win this one and go home with another shiny belt against Islam Makachev, he's gonna have to be perfect because Islam doesn't make mistakes. When it comes to striking, Oliveira is the better striker. He has proven this against some of the best in the division. He outbrawled Justin Gaethje and Michael Chandler. And unlike Habib, who seemed impervious to damage, Islam has been finished before. His lone loss was by TKO. While people argue that it was an early stoppage, he was rocked and dropped. And like Gaethje himself said, Charles hits unlike anyone else in the division. Yeah, I mean, it's a feeling. You know, it was a feeling I've never felt. You know, usually you get hit, call it a buzz, um, call it a flash. And this is more like my tongue just went on a super powerful battery. And it's just my entire body. It was crazy. That being said, Islam isn't like Gaethje or Chandler. He won't strike to win a stand-up battle. He'll strike to get close, clinch up, and drag Du Bronx down to the ground. Can he consistently do this while avoiding the power shots? Do you think in his heart he believes he's going to beat you? I don't think because, you know, I'm hard for it, fight for everybody because I have always same plan, take them down, hold him there. This is, I'm terrible fight for everybody. First grappling exchanges of this fight will likely determine the rest of the fight. And it's all about caution and respect. If Islam handles Charles on the ground and batters him, Charles might be too cautious of the takedown. If Charles rocks him on the feet and Islam gives too much respect to his power, the former champion will pick him apart from the distance. Whoever wins the first sequence will be in command. 
don't be surprised if a wild scramble completely shifts the tide of this fight. You have two elite grapplers inside the octagon. The grappling can be just as chaotic as the striking. The Oliveira Makachev fight, that's oh. the big one. That's the big one because there's so many questions. And, you know, Oliveira has never fought a grappler like Islam. No. But Islam's never fought a guy who can submit people like Oliveira yeah. can. It's an amazing card. You have two of the most dominant fighters in the most stacked division fighting for a vacant belt. It doesn't get any better than this. This is not the successor to Ferguson versus Habib. Calling it that would be doing this matchup the competing athletes a disservice. This is Charles Oliveira versus Islam Mahachev. And it's a whole new era. Se ele vai fazer aquilo que ele tá pretendendo fazer, que ele fez todo mundo quer botar para baixo, ele tá botando só o maior franza do da história do Ultimate para baixo. Dia 22 de outubro a gente vai ver quem é que é o melhor de. This will most likely go down as the biggest card of the year, and it demanded the biggest deeper dive out there. Three fights that are their own pay-per-views attraction. A rising superstar in the hunt for its first true kill, but in front of him stand not just any man. A former champion battles to recapture his beloved belt for the third time and stamps his name as a bantamweight great. But the champion of the world is looking to silence his doubters yet another time. And closing the night with the most anticipated fight of the year, a fight that could transcend the history of the lightweight division for years to come, and a fight between two men on massive win streaks, ready to show the world their true dominance. It's UFC 280 on October 22nd in Abu Dhabi where all the scores will be settled. And now that you have dived deep enough into the three fights that will headline the card of the year, let me know your deepest prediction down below. It's been a while since I formally said goodbye in my videos, but it's time for me to bounce. Catch y'all in the next one. Peace out.